please welcome our next panel, Strengthening Diversity in the Workforce, partnering with HBCUs. All right, hello and good morning everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation to the Business Roundtable for having us and to this incredibly esteemed panel that I have the pleasure of speaking with this morning. We have Robert Smith who runs Vista Equity Partners, $31 billion in equity investments under management and a portfolio that includes, I believe, 55,000 employees. 90,000 employees and 100 billion in assets under management. But there you go. The information counting? that I, I had know. was probably yeah. from a long time ago <laughs> right. then. Yeah. Marvin Ellison uh, has been running Lowe's Home Improvement since 2018, but has more than 30 years in uh, retail and operational executive leadership. And Harold Martin is the longest currently serving chancellor in the North Carolina University system, which I am a proud product of, currently the chancellor of North Carolina A&T. Thank you guys so much for being here. Before we jump into what's working and what could be done better, first tell me a little bit about initiatives that each of you have underway to help bridge the gap between the private sector and HBCUs. Robert, we'll start with you. Sure, well, we have a couple. Uh, I'll lead first with our Student Freedom Initiative, because uh, that's one of the things that I think ties into this panel. Uh, and what we've done is create a, a series of pillars and programs that, we, that enable certain companies, in, in our cases, to participate in shovel-ready projects to enhance HBCU connectivity, i.e. broadband access, their ability for them to also participate in, in uh, income contingent funding. So in other words, the ability to, to offset some of the student debt burdens that some of these students and their families face. So that's one component. We have another one which came out of the work of the BR, of BRT last or two years ago, uh, which is the uh, what we call the Southern Communities Initiative. And in that case, we're building capacity for, in this case, uh, seven communities that build out everything from the digitization of CDFIs, MDIs, the capillary banking system, enabling also broadband access into the communities of, of color into the United States, in addition to uh, uh, partnering with people like Grameen and the, the uh, NAACP to, to create small to medium business infrastructure funding and enablement. So those are just a couple of the, the major initiatives that came out of the work from last year to BRT. So we'll talk a little bit about affordability, about some of the regional disparities going forward. Marvin, what does Lowe's have in the pipeline right now? You know, in the past 12 months, we've uh, donated about $20 million to a group of HBCUs to set up uh, programs for students to major in retail, supply chain, information technology, just as a way to create a pipeline of talent <laughs> Uh, as they graduate uh, and they come out of those institutions. We're also proud to be a partnership with Gill, which provides the framework of our fee free tuition program for our employees. And we have North Carolina A&T, Morehouse, Paul Quinn College as part of those universities that we provide free tuition for any employee that wants to go back and get their degree. So those are just two things that we're doing. But a, a lot more work and, and, a, and a lot of energy around trying to take advantage of the, the amount of really great talent that's produced from these institutions. And Harold, what sort of relationships has North Carolina A&T been able to fortify in recent years as some of these initiatives have gotten underway? We spend a significant amount of our time engaging with corporate partners and, and uh, organizations to enhance the relationships that move from transactional uh, to partnerships that support a whole litany of activities that engage our university, that support our faculty, that support research, that supports mentoring programs for our students, that support curriculum uh, reform that ensures that we are engaging our students in the most competitive ecosystem uh, uh, possible to ensure that they're gaining the skills they need and readying them for the marketplace. So talk, Harold, a little bit about the curriculum mm -hmm. at North Carolina a and and HBCUs more generally. How closely does it hew to other top-tier universities, and how do you really focus on preparing these students to take a job at Vista Equity or at, at Lowe's, for instance? You'll find in most historical black college universities, there is a significant investment in academic programs that are relevant to today's demands. Uh, for example, we're a land-grant institution, we're big STEM. Most land-grant institutions are big STEM. We've got lots of engineers and scientists and mathematicians, et cetera. But those degree programs 
are relevant and competitive. You've seen a large number of historical black colleges and universities take a very serious deep dive in disposing of those programs that have been considered to be irrelevant to their institutions, competitiveness to today, and have been made strategic investments in new programs, data analytics, enhancements in computer science related programs, software development, uh, for example, that are critical to the emerging industries uh, represented by these two CEOs as examples who are looking for skill sets of our graduates who are going to help them be successful as well. And so their relationships with our university through those partnerships are helping us frame the new degree programs of the future and curricular requirements and skill sets that our graduates need today to be productive and successful. Robert, your firm focuses a lot on enterprise software, mm -hmm. but for the STEM initiative for, for HBCUs, why did you feel that was so important? Did you feel that black students were by and large not majoring or not studying STEM fields as much, or did you feel that that was going to continue to be where the economy goes in the future? It, 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 it's, a, it's a number of things, but a lot has to do with you know, what is the economy of the future. We are all, in, you know, prior to this pandemic, the, the, the topic we talked about at the BRT was digitization of this planet in essence. Every company was going through a transformation. Every university was going through a <laughs> digital transformation. And uh, what we really have is the, the scarcest resource on this planet are actually developers at, at the end of the day. You know, we, we have a, a gap of about two million in terms of what jobs are, 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 are out there and, and how many are being produced. We are falling behind in this country in the production of, of, these, of these students. And part of it is also creating the opportunity for people in, in, in this country to participate in this market. Uh, and so one of the things we did, we built uh, what's called InternX. InternX now has 14,000 uh, STEM students, African-American, uh, Latinx, and we have now over 200 business partners, uh, many of which, you know, Juliana was on, 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 on the last panel, uh, companies like Accenture participating that and providing internships. That's where the opportunity, the exposure. I started my career as an intern at Bell Labs and it changed my life. It gave me a view and experience uh, and expression in what the world of technology can be, um, whereas I wouldn't have had that in, in my normal day-to-day -day life where I grew up in, in, in Denver, Colorado. So I think it's critical for, as partners, uh, at the universities, as partners in corporations, to understand we have to create on-ramps. We have to create opportunities for these students to participate and see these industries and understand the impact of them. And in the world I live in, you know, 70% of my, you know, 90,000 plus employees are technically trained. So that's what we focus on STEM. It is a necessity to ensure that we get those sorts of, those, those sorts of students in the pipeline, give them opportunities, teach, train, develop, and, and show that they can have a, a wonderful career in, in technology in companies like ours. The New York Times had a fantastic piece this week. I'd encourage anyone to read it about why so many African American students are choosing to go to HBCUs other, over other, in, in some cases, Ivy League institutions. But in that article, the Times pointed out that HBCUs represent just 9% of black college grads. So Marvin, I'm wondering, when you look at that talent pool, why is that pipeline so important to you? Well, I think it's important because the history of HBCUs and the quality of the students that they produce is something that's unparalleled. You know, my son graduated from an HBCU. I mean, he moved from, from Tennessee to Dallas when we were living there, and I and I'd made a great acquaintance with uh, Michael Sorrell, who's president of Paul Quinn College. And I was so impressed with Michael when my son moved to Dallas, I introduced him, and my son decided to go to school there. So he received his degree you know, from an HBC. He had options to go anywhere that he wanted to attend, but, but he felt a kinship and a connection you know, to that university. I, I think it's important you know, for me, for all of us, I look at Dr. Martin and, 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 you know, and I think about the commitment that he's made and, and other things that he could do in other institutions that he could probably be affiliated with, but the commitment to an HBCU is something that I think that's not only enriching you know, for the community, but I think it creates a pipeline of talent and also maintains a cultural focus that I think is equally as important. And, and the good news is, is that you know, in North Carolina, as I was mentioning to him in the green room, I mean, we're, we're, we're you know, continuing to look for technology talent, and his university is, is just generating a lot of that talent, you know, and it's very competitive, but HBCUs have a history of just creating high quality, high caliber students that go out and do great things in the workforce. So Harold, talk a little bit about the development of some of those programs. Obviously, developing the curriculum, uh, 
purchasing the equipment, hiring the professors, none of that is free. How do you get the funding to do that and to remain competitive so that your students are as best equipped as they can be to work for any of these companies? We've had to do all of the above. We've had to um, reassess where we were investing current dollars uh, and we've had to be very proactive, unapologetically, with our polit political leaders, our state legislature, our governor, Congress, and build strong advocacy with those organizations. A high percentage of my time is engaging with those groups, sharing the impact of our university, uh, the demands for the resources we need to expand facilities, invest in scientific equipment, support the faculty of the future and the like for our institution. We've been very fortunate to be very shrewd about using the funds we have, but critically important around advocacy that has now generated substantially more state appropriations, congressional support for our institution as well. But we've also been very fortunate with a significant number of our alums who have done exceedingly well through philanthropy, uh, representatives like these two exceptional corporate executives who are helping us gain the support through partnerships with corporations who are substantially investing in our university today. That's critically important because not only is it important to support the faculty and scientific equipment, the technology and the facilities we need, but it also is critically important for the incredibly bright students we're attracting today. Most HBCUs support students, uh, about 60, 70 percent are Pell eligible, mm -hmm. which means they have financial need to attend the university, stay in institutions, and graduate on time. Federal financial aid helps, but it's far insufficient to help these young people meet their critical need. We're committed to ensuring that these students are graduating with as little debt as possible. That means that on top of the federal financial aid and what modest amount of funds their families may be able to provide, that our corporate partners and our alumni and friends of the institution are helping us make up the difference. And that's critically important if we're going to continue to produce the graduates of the future that are driving these industries and the government agencies that are demanding our graduates of the future. Robert, I mean, HBCUs are generally more affordable than other universities, but Spelman College was still about $30,000 last year. So right. how do you make right. this education more affordable? I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I'm, I'm going to pick up on a point that Dr. Martin talked about in the importance here in the BRT of corporations participating in this ecosystem. These are the students that will drive our businesses forward. We have a lack of talent uh, in, in our in our, in our basic economy uh, uh, with opportunity. And we can, we can actually you know, find this talent, develop this talent, and nurture this talent to participate in, in our business economy. I look at you know, one of the things, one of our partners here, uh, uh, Chuck Robbins at Cisco, partnered with us to actually enable the, the, uh, a cyber security digitization for all the HBCUs who were interested. We now have a third of them have signed up. Um, free, and in essence, that enables them to participate in over a billion dollars of Title IV funding that they would otherwise lose. That's you know, corporate partners, you know, partnering with, 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 with you know, universities and with, with, with companies and saying, let's change that dynamic. Part of that gives the training and enablement of these students to now participate as interns. And for instance, when we take on interns, they, they spend a time within, within VISTA and they end up with another $25,000 stipend to offset their student loans. You know, African-American students on average have $52,000 in loans coming out. Dr. Martin's, I think, are half of that. That's right. So being very thoughtful, focused, deliberate with the right partnerships, you can actually reduce that student loan bur uh, burden if you do it intentionally like, like he does. And for those that end up with those student loan burdens, unfortunately, what we see is those, those burdens actually increase because of the types of loans that they have, the parent plus loans. And four years later, their loans have actually increased in the principal value. And that's, that's a big challenge. And you know, that it defers the wealth creation opportunity. And it, it, it further creates that, wealth, you know, that, that racial wealth gap that we've been seeing, which is now almost seven times the average African-American family and the average white family in America. And that's not sustainable. And so we as corporate uh, participants and, and, you know, should find the, the partners in, in the universities and build these sustainable ecosystems to solve those problems. And we can do it. 
and we see it happening. So it's important that we just continue to put more resources, more capability, and frankly, more intentional thinking mm -hmm. around how to solve these problems. Well, since you mentioned overall student loan balances, I have to ask, do you think that one-time student loan forgiveness is good policy? I'm not sure it is. Uh, I think there are cer certain circumstances where it makes a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of sense. You know, one of the reasons we formed, you know, Student Freedom Fund or part of the Student Freedom Initiative is they don't pay the money back to the government. They pay it back into a fund that gets then borrowed by the next generation of students. And you know, there's, we, we have to alleviate the st student loan burden. Uh, otherwise, what we have to do is create you know, economic opportunities for people to outstrip that burden so they can actually participate in wealth creation. I, I just, you know, even uh, I see you know, various students who are graduating, and it's 15, 20 years before they paid off their loan where they can actually buy a house or buy securities or buy a stock and they, and they don't participate in what is the greatest part mm -hmm. of you know, the American economy which, which is opportunity to participate in capitalism. So those are the things that we have to be very thoughtful. We're in the right town for people to be thoughtful about it but we need to have you know, really, really uh, what, what I'll call thoughtful, thoughtful systems to solve these problems. So Marvin, within, within Lowe's, what is the company doing to help relieve that burden of some of its employees and to also cover some of the on-the-job training that's needed over the course of one's career? Well, I think it's in intentionality. To, to Robert's point, it's about the creation of wealth. You know, so, so we do a lot of education on being fiscal responsible, uh, on ensuring you understand how to generate wealth on a sustainable basis and creating opportunity. And, and at the end of the day, what corporations can do, we can, we can go out and support institutions of higher learning, we can support uh, organizations and, and movements and philosophies that Robert is championing, and we can create opportunity for students to come in and not just have a job, but a career. Uh, when I look at, at my company as an example, we're partnering with 110, and 110's initiative uh, is to have a, one million uh, individuals who are black in color, who are operating without a college degree uh, to have a life-sustaining job, which is defined as something from fifty-five to ninety thousand dollars a year, and so it's a little different from from talking about HBCUs. But we have a vast population of people of color who are highly intelligent and may have a certificate, but they don't have a four-year degree. Uh, and so the question is, how do you create economic opportunity for those individuals? And, and so we're proud that within the last year and a half, we've hired and or promoted almost 40,000 people that fall in that category. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all about creating the ability to generate wealth. The greatest thing about living in America is that we're in a, this capitalistic environment where you can come from all various types of backgrounds, but you have the ability to create wealth and to generate wealth on a sustainable basis if you're put in the right position and if you're giving the right set of tools. And, and so what we're trying to do at Lowe's is to generate wealth and give individuals the opportunity to be put in a position where they can see you know, their life transformed by an opportunity. So Dr. Martin, talk a little bit about the other side of the ledger. Obviously inflation is of huge concern to most Americans right now, but inflation in higher education has been going on for close to two decades. And I'm wondering how you think about setting the cost for an education for a student coming in and how sensitive you are to the ability of these students and their families to pay for it? We take uh, the cost adjustments for our university very seriously. Uh, we're in a university system, uh, and we have policies that require that we remain, for in-state students for our university, in the lowest quartile of a group of similar institutions for our university. So we have very low tuition in North Carolina overall. Out-of-state tuition is a little higher because you know, the out-of-state students' parents don't contribute to the tax base in North Carolina that ultimately supports tuition and our institutions, uh, for example. So we have not made adjustments to our tuition for in-state students in over five years. That's very intentional. Uh, and we've amped up substantially because, again, of the generosity of corporate partners and alumni and friends of our institution, the amount of grant aid that we afford students who are applying and attending our university. That's critically important. To follow up on something that uh, Robert and Emerson um, Ellison made a comment about a few moments ago, these incredibly white students are coming to our university at a time when, one, a college degree really is still critically important. It is the card to a higher, more successful life overall. If we aren't helping these students graduate with as little debt as possible, 
Many are going into the marketplace with a much higher debt than many of their comparable colleagues. They can't buy a home or invest in a car as readily. Many are incredibly gifted and want to go on to medical school, dental school, get an MBA, et cetera. And that is deterred because they have undergraduate debt. So we have to ensure that we are helping to continue to create uh, high percentages of African-American students who are leaving our institutions who are highly engaged with transforming our nation's capitalistic society. Additionally, more of our students are coming to our universities today than ever in the history of our institutions who want to be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They are starting their own businesses in high school. They want to continue that trend when they come to our universities. We have to help them develop those entrepreneurial skills and ensure that they're developing the right kind of business plans and pitching to the right organizations and understanding how to gain access to venture capital to start their businesses. And do so without the bureaucracy and the anxieties that their families and parents and grandparents mm -hmm. 30 and 40 years ago uh, had trepidation doing so because they didn't have the backing that many of these bright young people have today. So we have to elevate the opportunities uh, for them to see uh, what a Robert Smith is doing and seek to do similarly, mm -hmm. uh, quite candidly. And many want to do so in very significant ways. We have to make provisions for them to do so. You were, the purpose of this panel is to talk about the pipeline between HBCUs and the private sector. But during the pandemic, we saw this immense learning loss of the generation after that. And I'm wondering if we could just talk a little bit about the students coming into HBCUs in the next five to 10 years and how you see the pandemic having affected that pipeline and what that means for your companies over the next 10 to 20 years. Robert, I'll start with you. Sure, I, I think what we did learn is that there are multiple ways to learn. And this hybrid environment, um, we went from a time it was all in person to all hybrid, now we're in somewhere in between. Uh, and I think we're finding it to be an actually an effective, uh, and we will find the, the most effective equilibrium there. Um, I've noticed that the young people in our firm, many of which when I told them who had joined in the time where it was completely away from office, they said, oh, I don't want to go back in the office. They're the ones who are now leading into the office. And we're back to work three days in the office, you know, two out. But they find the engagement, the relationships, the teaching, the training is critically important. And I know that in the most engaging, I was just at, at my alma mater uh, schools, people have found when you have those engaging professors and teachers and, and, and environments, uh, students will find a way uh, to participate. That said, you know, the extensible learning environment has proven to be effective as well. You know, we have within Vista, for instance, our Vista University, we have, you know, companies that actually teach and train developers and they never meet. They never meet in person and we're finding the productivity of those, of those, those workers, which is we, you know, we, we capture and measure it, to actually be very high. So, you know, the human capacity to develop and evolve in a learning environment, I think, is, is, is phenomenal, one. And I think we as institutions, institutions of higher learning, institutions where, where we are actually, you know, performing the task and the work of capitalism, um, can just need to now ensure that we create the opportunities to see those students and give them a chance to participate in, in our ecosystems effectively. That, that's my sense of it. Marvin, how do you feel about the high school set? and how many people that would be Lowe's store associates or would be Lowe's middle or upper management in the generation to come uh, did not feel compelled by their educator, did not have a computer to log yeah. into their virtual learning. How do you try to, to restore that pipeline? No, it was interesting. I mean, I was one of those parents that had a uh, graduating senior in high school uh, when the pandemic uh, became really unmanageable and after the holiday season, she never went back to school. She didn't go to a prom. Uh, she never had a real graduation. Uh, and, and I'm sitting back remembering, you know, my 12th grade year and the experiences and the memories from that. And, and I felt like that she was just robbed from that. But what I quickly learned is just how resilient she was and how resilient her friends were, how mm -hmm. agile. They just, they managed through it. And, and in Charlotte, as an example, where we're headquartered, uh, we, we partnered with the, the mayor's uh, racial initiative and, and, and donated you know, quite a bit, I think roughly $10 million, 
partly because of the lack of broadband access. Because where my daughter was one of the haves, there were a lot of have-nots. And, and, and I found out, and, and, and this was a great learning for me, that we had so many kids and families in that community that didn't have access to Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. uh, didn't have access to computers. And, and, and so we scramble with other you know, corporate partners to try to fill that void. But, but I think that's a huge opportunity. And, and I, I do believe for the resilience of my daughter and, and some of the children that were blessed to have families that had a different financial status, for kids that were on the other side of that, you know, it, that was a very devastating time for them. And, and so I think, I think to Robert's point, I mean, we, we all have to find ways to contribute. And one thing that I have so much respect for him is just the action behind his words. Mm -hmm. And we were talking in the green room about, you know, talking less and doing more, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he's an example of, of action, you know, and movement and, and fewer words. And I think companies have to follow that. And that's something that I'm trying to do is make sure that we get engaged so we can help to solve some of these problems. Everything can't be solved by the government. Right. I mean, private business, uh, you know, uh, institutions of, of higher learning, et cetera, and, and just philanthropy. I mean, we just have to all just chip in, and I think that's how you solve it. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I, I would make a comment. Um, you know, one of the things we're doing actually in South Carolina, in Orangeburg, so this is, we call it, you know, public-private type of a partnership. <laughs> Um, they realized with this infrastructure bill that they didn't have projects that were shovel ready. So uh, we, along with a couple of our, our partners, got involved and said, okay, what do they actually need? So we put together a master plan with, with you know, Orangeburg, and now they are ready to actually you know, pull broadband or actually uh, uh, fiber cable and now make the HBCUs there ISP mm -hmm. providers. Yeah. So think about it. You've built the infrastructure, okay, and then you can actually have, you know, Claflin is one of them, will be the ISP provider, not only for the students, but for the community. Mm -hmm. And so it creates, again, an ecosystem of opportunity, but it takes, you know, business leaders partnering with the public sector, partnering with, with you know, institutions of higher learning, in this case, HBCUs, and we have that model. Now we're rolling that model out to 70 other communities, uh, and any of these corporations can participate, but rolling out to 70 other communities that are anchored by the HBCUs in that community that are in these broadband deserts. That's so great. that's an important part of you know, how we have to think as Americans to solve our own problems for our community and with those sort of partnerships. You mentioned government funding, which is a great segue uh, for Dr. Martin. I mean, our audience here, many of whom are congressional staff, some of you worked on the American Rescue Plan, $2.7 billion in that package for HBCUs. How easy was it to unlock those funds? How easy was it for you to deploy those? And what more do you think is needed from here? We were very fortunate. Uh, as part of the deliberations for the legislation that created rescue funds, that we had sufficient advocates in Washington uh, on behalf of the HBCUs. And so as the rescue funds were being finalized, a segment was appropriated for higher education in general. All institutions were able to benefit but our advocates for HBCUs, Thurgood Marshall, UNCF, and others, uh, Congresswoman Alma Adams and others, uh, fought tooth and nail to add additional appropriations for HBCUs. That was added on top of the appropriations for all higher education. The HBCUs benefited uh, quite substantially from the appropriations. The flexibility was quite simple. Uh, the funds were made available, ease of use, and access and deployment within our campuses. Most of the HBCUs use those funds. At least 70% of those dollars went directly to students in technology, funding support for tuition, housing, dining support, and living arrangements for students who are adult learners, who have children, and had to make provisions for their families, and other uh, living expenses as well. Those funds were deployed in substantial ways. And so those funds made a huge difference in our students across HBCUs, and certainly on our campus, to be able to attend education, not have to pay for books, have access to free iPads and other laptop technologies. And those students who lived in communities uh, who wanted to stay home and be involved in online learning and could not, we made provisions for them to have access to broadband or made provisions for them to have access to those technologies on our campus. So our students did better academically during the pandemic because of how those funds were invested in very strategic and very significant ways. So 
If we have uh, congressional staffers in the room, we want to say thank you for all the work you did on behalf of our institutions <laughs> for sure. Uh, do we need additional dollars? Absolutely. Uh, we have the highest enrollment in summer school for the last couple of years mm -hmm. on our university, uh, at our university because we're paying all the tuition for our summer stu students and housing, record numbers of students who want to stay in school and continue to make progress toward graduation in a timely fashion. I did want to make an additional point though here. Uh, for students coming out of high school today, uh, many of these students may not have had access to some of the technology and all of the academic support that they needed and may have seen some levels of loss in learning and certain levels of experiences. But these students also observed very significantly those impacted most significantly as a result of the pandemic were people in their own communities, mm -hmm. black and brown people all over America and those who were first to be fired or laid off were individuals without degrees or education. And so they have realized that it is critically important, even more so today, that they get an education. And so you're seeing record numbers of African-American students, rural and urban communities, applying for college, and high percentages going to HBCUs today because of the enormous support these institutions are making available to these students to continue to be successful. With our final minute, I would love to get closing thoughts from our two private sector panelists. Marvin, uh, what more do you think can be done in the near term by uh, those in the audience today? Give them a call to action. From uh, really the government is, well, look, I, I just think that the government can't solve all of our problems. Uh, I, I think that's the fundamental point that I'll make. This is, this is a collective effort uh, by private business, by philanthropy, uh, by institutions of higher learning in support of the government, not the government pulling and taking all the burden. I mean, that's, that's never sustainable uh, because administrations changes, policies change, and so you don't want to be dependent on something that's not going to be there in four years. You want to, you want to create self-sufficiency and you want to create opportunity. I mean, what I've said throughout my entire career as a black man raised, raised in the South, you know, trying to strive and, and try to quote unquote climb the corporate ladder, the only thing I want you to give me is an opportunity. That's it, because I can control the rest. Uh, and, and so I think what, what the government can do is provide opportunity, support our institutions of higher learning, because the, the fundamental pipeline of, of our future is coming out of universities like North Carolina A&T. So, so if the government can do anything, create a pathway, create a sustainable way for our, our best and brightest to go and, and help us be a great country in the future by supporting our institutions of higher learning. Robert, your final thoughts? I would say for those in the government, enable every HBCU to have access to broadband capacity. Plain and simple, that's number one. Whatever you do, whatever administration you're in, if you enable those HBCUs to do that, those students, those students will make a difference. They will get engaged, they will get involved, they will figure out ways to make a productive use of their lives and their communities to support the expansion of the American economy. So that's point one. For the private sector, work with these, the, these institutions of higher learning to enable them to have their students to have access to the opportunity. That means internships, lots of them, and frequently, and flexibly. And I think if we do those things, we're going to find a greater society that we're all going to be able to participate in because we're going to give the opportunity to all citizens in America to participate in this digital economy and participate in this, this thing called capitalism. Amen. Well, as we continue having this conversation over the years, hopefully tangible signs of progress from these comments today. Gentlemen, thank you so thank much, you. Thank you so much. for being here. Excellent. And thank you to our thank attentive you. audience. We appreciate it.